had some reading ups and some reading downs in 2021, but I'm happy to say that December closed out the year on a good note. I read some fantastic books this month and well, now I'm gonna tell you about them. everyone, Rosie here. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm not going to say I can't believe that 2021 is already over, although secretly I really can't believe it. Instead, I'm just going to start talking about some of the fabulous books I read in December because, as I said, there were a lot and I really enjoyed them and I feel like I'm going to have a lot to say. The first book I read was The Heart of a Woman by Maya Angelou. This is the fourth of her autobiographies. It takes place in the early 1960s, Angelou moves to New York and ends up getting involved both with the black arts movement in the city and also with the civil rights movement in the city. She then meets and very quickly marries a South African activist in exile. There were so many points while I was reading this book where I was simultaneously 100% absolutely admiring her bravery, admiring her sense of just, I'm just gonna go out and do it. I don't know how this is gonna go, I'm just gonna do it. And that's something I don't really have, so I really admire that. But I was also just going, oh girl, is this a good idea? Oh, this seems like a mistake. This seems like you're gonna regret this. The amazing thing about Angela is even when it was a mistake, she still manages it to turn it on its head and turn it into a success. As you can tell, I love her writing. I've talked about that every time I've read one of her books. I'm not going to stop. One thing that really jumped out to me with this book, however, was how she has such a precise sense of when her writing should give just a general, incredibly evocative sense of atmosphere, when she should get super detailed and deep dive into the intense and nuanced personal emotions of a situation, and when she should be making a powerful political statement. I think lots of authors can do one of those amazingly well, but the fact that Angelou can do all three and can blend them together so seamlessly and beautifully within one book is always just awe-inspiring. Then I read three books for the Queer Lit Readathon, and I did an entire vlog about that and talked about these books pretty extensively there, so I'm gonna link that up here and just talk briefly about the books now so this video doesn't get stupid long. First, I read Amber Lowe by Lara Elena Donnelly. This is a spy political novel in a fantasy universe where there's no magic. So like, it's not our world, but there's not magic or anything. It's just another world. It's got a sort of 1920s-esque vibe, but also definitely not just 1920s. It's 1920s, but twisted. We follow two key characters who start out the novel as lovers. One of them is a smuggler, the other is a spy. Political events drive them apart and we follow as they are trying to keep their heads above water in a very fraught situation. I loved the beginning. The beginning was phenomenal and the rest of the book was solidly good. Like I liked all of this book, even if I didn't love how it ended. I really think I'm gonna like the sequels a lot as well. I also read Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. This is a collection of essays about feminism and race and sexuality and most importantly intersectionality of all of these things and more. I hate that this is the case, but I feel like this is a book that should be required reading for everybody, at least in North America, probably in most of the rest of the world as well, but I won't speak authoritatively for that. So many of the elements that Lord was talking about in these essays, which were written in like the 70s and 80s, are still so profoundly relevant in 2022. And finally, I read A Dream of a Woman by Casey Plett. This is a collection of short stories about trans women. I liked the themes and the ideas a lot. I thought there was some super interesting stuff on that front. However, the style and the tone of the writing just didn't work for me. It wasn't bad writing, it wasn't poorly written, but when I read short stories, I tend to want them to make me feel something, and these just 
didn't make me feel anything. But I know other people absolutely love this book. I think it really is just a matter of taste. The rest of the month of December I basically dedicated to treat myself reading and I started that off on such a strong note with An Elderly Lady is Up to No Good by, who is this by? It's by Helen Turston and I don't have the translator noted, that'll be in the description below. This is a collection of short stories about an 88 year old woman, Maud, who lives in Jytteborg in southern Sweden and is a murderer. I, there's no way to avoid saying that. I think she kills someone in every single one of these stories. I absolutely loved this writing style and each individual story was great and I adore adored it. I did feel that some of the earlier stories maybe would have made sense in a slightly different order. It felt like we were jumping back and forth a lot, but within a short span of time, not like years, but like months, and that was a little strange. But overall, this was so good. Maud is one of those characters who if I met her in real life, I would not like at all, I don't think. But reading about her is such a delight. One element that I really enjoyed is that yes, she's a murderer, but she's also selfish and manipulative and kind of just a horrible person to other people in general. She can be kind, she can be caring, but I kind of liked that she is a bad person overall because a truly good little old lady wouldn't murder people. And overall, it was just absolutely so much fun to read about a little old lady being so terrible, plus, this book and its sequel, which I'll get to soon, are so atmospheric. There's so many little descriptions about like what she has for breakfast and how she goes about her life that some people might find boring, but I eat that stuff up. Amazing. I listened to this on audiobook. It was really, really short. They're just tiny little books. I really hope Tristan comes out with a third book about Maud and I will read it immediately. I also read Hogfather by Terry Pratchett. I have talked about this book so extensively already this month that I'm just going to say it's kind of Christmas, but Discworld, it's amazing. It features death and his fantastic granddaughter Susan, and I have an entire book and bake talking about it, so you can watch that, or there will be a link in the down below to the live stream where I talked about it with Katja and Scott. I don't need to talk about that more. Next up, I have An Elderly Lady Must Not Be Crossed, again by Helen Turston. The first half of this book is Maud reminiscing about her youth and some things that happened when she was very young as she travels from Sweden to South Africa to go on a tour. And then the rest of the book is following her on this tour in South Africa and what's going on while she's traveling. I framing for including the initial stories as memories was is fine. I didn't think it was necessary. I think you could have done sort of a novella and then some short stories without tying it into like, and then she fell asleep on the plane and was thinking about this, but whatever, it doesn't distract from the story that much. I didn't love the parts about her actually traveling around South Africa quite as much. The pacing was maybe a little off. There felt like a lot of, this is good, but not great because it's just a introverted kind of grumpy little old lady going on a trip, which is fun, but not what you signed up for. I think things could have been spread out a bit differently to make that part more engaging, but it was still really good. Even if I didn't love it quite as much as the first, I'm still a big fan of the style and the series overall. After finishing that, I needed another audiobook and I picked up A Million Years in a Day by Greg Jenner. I really love Greg Jenner's podcast, You're Dead to Me. I really wanted to pick up his latest book, Ask a Historian, which has just come out, and I was checking to see if it was on script, and that one wasn't, but two of his earlier books, including A Million Years in a Day, were, so I thought I would give this a go. I'm really trying to lean into reading pleasurable nonfiction, not just heavy, serious nonfiction all the time, and I thought this would be perfect. It's about the evolution of the mundane and like how did we get to the way we live our lives now by examining history, so looking at like going to the bathroom in the morning. How has that changed through history? What, Where have been some notable advancements? This was initially love at first sight. I'm completely obsessed. This is gonna be a new favorite book. A lot of people complain about the humor in this. I liked it. I think it's one of those types of humor that either it's for you or it's not. And I do really like the humor and the style of writing. That was fantastic. However, there is a bit of a problem 
with regards to books like this, which try and cover so much information at sort of a relatively high level. There were several sections where the information didn't feel like a well-researched book by a historian and felt a lot more like this is something I would read in a BuzzFeed listicle. And it just didn't feel like there was enough depth or nuance to how he was discussing some of this information. And ultimately, I don't think that's necessarily Jenner's fault. This is an incredibly broad topic to be writing about. There is so much information. At the end of the day, he's only one person and this is only one book. Much as I would love to read a book where every single chapter in this book is its own volume and it's super well researched, super in depth, but also funny, I can understand why that wouldn't really sell so well to publishers or audiences. I know that that's kind of niche. There were also a few instances where I felt like he was slightly leaning into the inaccuracies for shock value and that I didn't appreciate so much. Especially in a book like this, which spoke in the introduction about how it aimed to show how people in the past weren't fundamentally different from us, really we're all kind of the same blah blah blah, I think to then lean into ridiculous things that are either not accurate or you're really misrepresenting the situation for shock value, I just think that's kind of harmful. Yes, it was about corsets, and I'm not going to rant about what it was, but I'm sure you can guess. All of that makes it sound very negative. It wasn't. I gave this book four stars. I thought it was thoroughly enjoyable. It just wasn't as good as it could be. I think I need to learn that I'm maybe moving past these introductory type history books. And now I need to figure out what I want to read instead because I love the idea of this type of book every time, but I always seem to come away feeling like, I feel like this could be researched better. I feel like this could be so much more in depth. So I guess now I need to go out and find those books that are more in depth about all these random topics. I then read Bad Gods by Gay Siebold. I had this as an arc, so thank you to NetGalley, and I forgot to note the publishers, but thank you to whoever that was. This is actually a reissuing of a book that came out 10 years ago. It's got a new title and a new cover, but it's the same text as far as I know. So that was cool. I probably never would have seen or picked it up if I hadn't come across it on NetGalley, and it was really fun. This is a book that immediately throws you into a vast and complicated fantasy world. There is so much information flying around. At first it can be a little disorienting, but I think that really adds to the atmosphere of the book and gives you a sense of this world because this feels like a super complicated and disorienting world. Both the fantasy world and the cast of characters gave me very Firefly vibes, both in just the sense of how the world was described and the types of people that we meet in it. I know a lot of things get described as Firefly vibes, but this very much felt like Firefly but fantasy. And different plot, like not the same kind of plot line, but general vibes. We follow the protagonist Babylon Steel, who owns and works in a brothel in this sort of hub city that lots of people travel to and from. It's very big, it's very complicated. She takes on a side job to find a missing heiress, princess type person. As all of this is happening, there is religious fundamentalism that seems to be on the rise, and someone is attacking sex workers. In terms of plot, it definitely starts out with you sitting there going, how is any of this going to be related? How is this going to come together? What's going on? And by the end of the book, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, you managed to pull that off. You pulled all of this in. I thought that was going to be a random little why are we seeing this moment, but actually it tied in. To add complication, we also have a dual timeline. And at the end of almost every chapter, there's a flashback to Babylon's teenage years. And it sort of slowly explores how she became the person that she is today, which again, at first I was kind of like, okay, cool. What's it got to do with anything? Stick with it, it does pull together, and it does pull together so beautifully. Given that this is a book that came out in 2011 and features sex workers as a lot of the characters, I was nervous going in about how those characters were gonna be portrayed. As far as I could tell, I thought it was really well handled. I would, of course, be very interested in seeing a review from someone who is a sex worker and see what their take on that is, but overall I was very pleasantly surprised. It was fun, it was a good read, and I might even pick up the sequel or wait to see if it gets reissued on 
as well, and I can get into that in that galley. We'll see. Speaking of sequels, I then read The Man Who Died Twice by Richard Osman. This is the second book in the Thursday Murder Club series. In this one, we've got drug dealers, we've got massive diamond theft, we've got the mafia, we've got spies, and all of it ties back to this quaint little retirement village. I liked this one even better than Thursday Murder Club. Thursday Murder Club was solid, but had a few flaws for me. I felt like all of those were resolved in this book. One of my main gripes with Thursday Murder Club was the fact that Elizabeth, the spy character, seemed to call in favors too often, and too many things could be resolved by her just calling in a favor from someone. And I liked that not only was that remarked on in this book, but I also felt like the story was constructed and the characters behaved in a way where that wasn't a thing so much. It felt a lot more like all of the characters getting involved and contributing and being active participants in solving this case. Hi, post-filming, pre-editing Rosie popping on because I just remembered something vitally important about this book that I totally forgot to mention in my review. And that is a one-line detail. A character said in a rude way, that man couldn't catch COVID implying like he couldn't get anything, he's so useless. But that brings up some really weird implications about this book because the character saying that implies that COVID is an event that has happened in this universe. But that line is the only reference to COVID in this entire book set in a retirement facility, which means it is somehow sufficiently in the future from now that COVID is like not a huge deal still. It was weird and it was the first time I have encountered this, but I feel like we're going to see more and more little things like that line pop up, which make you go, wait, are we in a COVID world or not COVID world in this fictional setting? Are we acknowledging what has happened and how the world has changed? Or are we pretending it hasn't? And that's going to be a choice that I think authors are going to have to start making. I'm sure this is not an original thought, but it occurred to me while reading this book. And well, what's a booktube channel for if not sharing the thoughts you have about books? As I said, I really liked it. I thought it was so good and I'll be looking forward to the third, which I mean, I don't think it's been announced yet, but whenever it is, I'll be looking forward to it. Keeping on the mystery theme, I read Feet of Clay by Terry Pratchett. This is the third City Watch novel and the 19th Discworld novel. As always, I have no idea how to describe this. See the book and bake that I mentioned earlier if you want to know why I find that so hard. But Vetinari seems to be poisoned. No one can work out how. Two men have turned up dead with seemingly no one else in the room with them when they were very meticulously killed. And Corporal Littlebottom has joined the City Watch. A dwarf, Littlebottom is the forensics expert and also making waves by tentatively putting her foot out and saying, actually, maybe I don't want to present as male as all female dwarves do. Quite scandalous. I don't have much of a review other than to say that I still love this book. It was so good. It was so much fun. I feel like a bit like I'm cheating to say that I figured out the poisoning plot well in advance of when it's revealed because I have read this before, but it was still really fun to read through and be like, oh right, I remember what's happening and then to see all the clues. That was great. It was the perfect cozy, relaxing read for that period between Christmas and New Year's when really all you're doing is sitting around in pajamas, reading books, eating chocolate. I have three more books to mention, but none of which I'm going to do a full review of because none of them I have finished. First, I have House of Leaves by Mark said Danielewski. I read a large chunk of this book in December and I will link my first reading vlog up here so you can see my thoughts so far if you don't mind spoilers, but I'll be finishing that in January and doing a couple more videos about it then. I also started reading Casanova by Lawrence Burgreen. This is a biography of the famous, infamous Venetian player. It's a long book and I've only been picking it up here and there when I want something to read before I fall asleep, and so I'm by no means close to done, but hopefully I'll finish that in January and share my thoughts in my January wrap up. And finally, I also 
started and very quickly DNF'd Stick a Flag in It by Aaron Lomas. This was an arc from NetGalley and it seems to have been first published in 2020, but on NetGalley it's listing 2022, so I don't know if maybe it's finally being released in North America as opposed to the UK or something like that. This is supposed to be a humorous, irreverent history of Britain. Sounds right up my alley, doesn't it? That sounds like the sort of book that I would eat up even if it's not perfect. But from the introduction, it very much was written in a weird way that seemed to be gearing up to celebrate the influence of the British Empire on the world as opposed to highlight the atrocities it committed. So it was already a bit, ooh, really? We're gonna go there? We're gonna celebrate administrative efficiency and downplay genocide? I feel like we've got our priorities skewed a bit here. And then I started reading it. It starts with 1066, the Norman invasion, William the Conqueror, blah, blah, blah. And, with, and within the first chapter, there was information that was at best presented in a very misleading way, and at worst was just flat out wrong. That was like alarm bell number two going, really, you're gonna confidently mess up on something so basic in your first chapter? It was about Indo-European languages, in case you're curious, and Lomas seemed to be claiming that the Romance languages were not Indo-European languages, and it's like, yes, they are. They're a branch of the Indo-European languages just as much the, as the Germanic languages are. I was going to keep reading until maybe 10% of the book. I got to about 5%, FYI. Give it a bit more of a go before I DNF'd, although I was already feeling like, I don't know if I want to read this. And then when I went to market as currently reading, I saw a review from someone who gave it two stars and said basically that the first half of the book was handled quite well and that once it got into the part about the British Empire just sort of dissolved into disturbing fanboyism almost. I'm paraphrasing the review, but that was enough for me to say no, I don't need to waste my time with this. And those are the books that I read in December. I've lost track of how many it was, and that doesn't really matter. What matters is that I really enjoyed them, and I had a really fun month reading them. I really hope that that will continue in January of 2022. Let me know down below what was your favorite book that you read in December, or if you're feeling ranty, what was your least favorite book that you read in December? And if you like this video, please give it a like down below. If you would like to see more of my videos, please hit subscribe, and thank you for watching.